you, thank you. Yeah, nice group for Super Bowl Sunday. Thank you guys. Uh, who is it, the, the Mets versus the Bruins? <laughs> Glad you guys understood that one. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and no, I thank you guys so much for coming out. It's really, um, it's an honor to be able to travel the world and meet people of like mind and, and sometimes of differing minds. It's really, um, it's beautiful to meet groups, not just of a psychedelic persuasion, but in um, really deeply invested in understanding the self, in coming into some kind of relationship with our own path within. Psychedelics are an uh, extremely powerful tool for that, though they are not the only tool. And actually, uh, I was racking my brain for a while trying to think of what I wanted to share to a group of people who have a lot of, you know, varying degrees of experience with psychedelics. Uh, plant medicines, I like to use that word more. Um, but I was racking my brain trying to figure out what to share, and um, I had this moment where I was, I was watching back through some of Terrence McKenna's uh, stuff, and he, I can't even remember the exact wording, but someone asked him, like, do you do drugs? And he said, no, man, I am drugs, <laughs> right? And so this was early on in my life where I began realizing that we ourselves produce, we are biochemical machines, um, and we produce I have a friend of mine, John Chavez, he wrote a book called uh, Questions for the Lion Tamer, all about the endogenous production of DMT. And this guy's taught me quite a bit in the book and also by phone. Um, but he calls it endowaska. We produce cascades of different biochemicals that work in tandem, in concert with one another, and they produce different experiences. And the more I, I was so fascinated by that, by how and why we produce chemicals that can bring about a different perspective, uh, bring about a different feeling inside. And the more I began looking into it, uh, the more I started realizing there are a bunch of ways, tools for ascension, I would say. There are a bunch of things that we can do that are free to us, they don't cost anything, but it's a discipline. And it, it sometimes works the very first time that you do it, but a lot of times the more you discipline yourself and the more you match these practices that aren't ingesting psychedelics, but more or less doing these practices with set and setting, um, that they really fine tune these practices in uh, what I believe the reason for these plants to even be here to begin with is to break us out of the box or the narrative of who and what we think we are so we can then, like the show that I, uh, I host is called, we can understand what our limitless capacity is. Now I don't say limitless lightly, um, but I do understand that we have to start with what we know. A lot of people, we use the word impossible. We were born and raised in a culture with this word impossible. And whereas I don't like to just come in and say that nothing is impossible, I like to push on the boundaries of what we believe is possible because I'm going to show you a couple examples of people that pushed those boundaries and did things that academia and science was saying is impossible. So we do a lot of taking authoritarian figures such as our parents, such as society, especially people in white lab coats, uh, and what they tell us we take it as fact. And what I'm saying is that it's, it's very important to have uh, academia the way that it is, but it is also important to understand that not many of us have it figured out, and even if somebody explaining to us something that they have completely figured out, they have to translate it to us in a certain way, and we as kids or as even adults, we take what they say and sometimes we just push it back into our subconscious and that becomes a part of our fabric and we draw upon that fabric without even realizing it. And a lot of the times, the number one thing, or the, the main things that we don't push against, the boundaries that we don't push or test out, are the things that we find to be impossible. Because why would we? If, if we think it's impossible, then we just take that as the contours of the room that will never change, and we try and dance within that room when we might see, as Carl Sagan said, you know, if, if we only live on a two-dimensional plane and then there's something that can rise above 
and see the grand picture of it, the grand architecture of it, we may realize that we have much more potential than we've ever given ourselves credit for, but we would never know to question it if we didn't have some kind of impetus, some kind of reason. And there's many examples that I'll show you of people that whether because they simply chose to or some fated event caused them to push beyond the boundaries of what they thought was possible. And these are, these are people that will go down in history, in my mind and in the world's mind. So, um, who here would say that 2019 was a particularly challenging year? So you guys all had twins as well. <laughs> I had twins on New Year's Day of last year. Yeah, and um, uh, no, my first thought was not, damn, I just missed the tax break from last year. Uh, but uh, I have a four-year-old daughter and twin newborn boys, and um, it's a wild ride. It's a really wild ride, and one thing to kind of put this in context, one thing that I realized this past year was we can take so much more than we, we maybe think we can as far as stress, novelty, confusion, whatever it might be. We can take so much more and it usually is that stress and those pressures that cause us to step beyond our boundaries. Have any of you been in a situation where you are extremely stressed and you're so consumed by your stress and your circumstance and then all of a sudden somebody, let's say, hurts themselves or something very tragic happens? You can snap out of it like that to be of service, right? For me, I always notice that when I'm caught up in the financial stressors of life and whatever it is, um, I instantly snap out of it as soon as one of my kids maybe falls over or something seems to happen that causes me to step into a different role, a step into that I am here in service and nothing else in that moment, not any of the financial concerns or the living concerns seem to matter. This is one beautiful example of when we change the narrative, when we change the story that we are consumed by, Simply by stepping out of it, we are already accessing more of ourselves. And I don't believe that we are just this body. I think that when we are in ego, all right, cool. <clears throat> when we are in ego, we are like the particle as opposed to the wave. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But we are not on the same wavelength anymore. We are isolated in that way. And I feel that when we step outside of that and we realize that in the same way that baseball players, they can use a baseball so, or a baseball bat so effectively, it's like an extension of their body. People who spin poi or hacky sack. It's finding the, that your environment is an extension of your very own body. So I call this Psychedelica Tools for Ascension. Let me close this then. And really, what are, what are tools for ascension? Well, what is ascension? We'll get into this a little bit. But what I, want to, uh, what I want to start off with is a way to connect us all in this room and you out there slightly outside of the room. <laughs> um, have any of you done breath work before? All right. All right. Uh, well, raise your hands if you haven't done breath work. Okay, all right. You guys want to do about a minute of breath work? Okay. There's many different kinds of breath work that I've, uh, I've trained in. Um, Butaiko breathing. Um, there's holotropic, rebirthing, transformational. Um, there's a bunch of different names for it, but Wim Hof is the one that I've probably been uh, spending the most amount of time with. And really, it all kind of bounces, bounces around between controlled breathing, whether you're slowing it down or you're hyperventilating, and then breath retention. And what that does is that causes for uh, peptides in the lungs to go through our cerebrospinal fluid up to the periaqueductal gray matter. And many things happen from that, but what seems to happen in this and what we're starting to get a little bit more evidence on based out of the University of Michigan is that these breathing techniques and people who've done 
Wim Hof breathing transcendental breath work, they find that it's similar to a DMT experience. Now we won't be able to get there in a minute, but you'll probably be able to get to uh, a certain point for those of you who haven't done it within a minute. And I'll show you the breathing exercise real quick. And what it's gonna be is a strong inhale. Now you wanna be able to expand, you feel the expansiveness. So it's a, uh, and it's a relaxed exhale. So a strong yes to life and a relaxed letting go of whatever does not serve you. And you can keep that in mind because visualization is a big part of it. So a strong inhale to a yes to life, a relaxed exhale to a letting go of all that does not serve you. And at the end, what I'll say is, all right, completely out, completely in and hold. And when you hold at that moment, you're going to notice probably the biggest head shift, maybe a little bit of lightheadedness. And then you'll probably notice that you can hold your breath a little bit longer than you expected. You don't have to go until you can't hold your breath anymore. Um, but this exercise, if repeated three or four times, is exactly what you should do if you plan on ever doing an ice bath. All right. Have you ever done an ice bath? Anyone? All right. I suggest you guys try it. But we'll do the breathing technique right now. And the reason why I like this is because it connects us. We are connected by the breath in the same way that uh, all the continents, continents are connected by the air and the water. We are breathing the same air. And in that, if you think of chi, chi moves through the air as well. And they, they say that chi is energy impregnated with information. So we are sharing information, communicating in a different level. If you've ever been to Hawaii, you see the way that they greet one another forehead to forehead and they breathe at the same time. There's a greeting. And when I lived in Hawaii, they called us howlies, which means without breath. <laughs> us as in um, the, the white foreigners that came into the country and we greeted each other like this. So let's greet each other with breath. Okay, like I said, strong inhale. Relaxed, exhale. You can close your eyes and we'll just visualize <clears throat> saying yes to life and letting go of all that does not serve us so it can go back and be recycled. All right? Okay, in. Keep it going. If it gets too intense, just slow it down. Embrace the tingling. A little more. Three more. One more. Completely out. Completely in. Hold. Find the stillness. Just come back to the room and go ahead and open your eyes. Now, it wasn't that long. How quickly did uh, you start feeling the tingling? 
Was it pretty, pretty promptly? Did any of you not feel any tingling? No? Did any of you have lightness of head once you held your breath? There's something about the breath retention specifically that allows you to go into the stillness. And um, in that moment, that is the moment, especially the, mo the moment of the breath retention, the holding of the breath where we are flooded, all neuropeptides go from the lungs into the cerebrospinal fluid, again, up into the brain, and DMT, potentially MAOIs, like what's in the, the vine, the ayahuasca vine, penaline, and there's a couple others, start flooding your system. And if you do this for 30 minutes, then you can go another 15, 20 minutes and just lay there and experience the feeling, but there's something about breath. It is, it is the core, it's the key. Um, when you're exercising, your breath augments. When you're scared, your breath changes. When you step in the cold water, it's actually all the information that's being flooded through your system causes a breath shift. There's something about the breathing that instantly interfaces with our nervous system, which is pretty cool. I won't go into what I believe right now what I believe that that all means, but breathing and controlled breathing specifically seems to be one of the most healing practices we can engage in. And it's also very similar to many other psychedelic experiences when you do it for extended periods of time. Stan Groff was, I wouldn't say one of the first, because this has probably been known for a long, long time. Tibetans were doing things like called tumo breathing. Uh, which is the same as what Wim Hof is doing nowadays. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. There's a um, ashram in Mahabra on Whittier Boulevard run by two female Mahatmas. Um, they come from India by way of Tibet. And every Wednesday night at 7 for an hour, um, they'll do 20, 25 minutes of pranayama, a lot of the breathing exercise mm -hmm. in and out. And then they'll do about 20, 25 minutes of home chanting, they dim the lights. And you find that when you're doing the home and you're letting it out, and you get to that space where you're doing one every 30 seconds, so two <clears throat> breaths a minute. Afterwards, everyone is just so chill, they don't want to leave. Um, this was a different experience, though. This is different. This is something else. Yeah, this is like Wim Hof breathing. And so holotropic breathing stuff is more like <sighs> So you're pushing out more. That gives you a different experience. There's also just the same kind of circular breathing, but if you extend it out 20, 30 minutes, um, it gives you a different experience than this. This one decouples the pain protein, and that's why it allows you to do ice baths without the pain telling you to stop and get out, because it decouples a pain protein. Um, when you're mentioning chanting, I'll get into a little bit of uh, interesting science about our anatomy and what seems to be happening, especially inside your skull at the time of om chanting, open, uh, open mouth and open throat singing as well. Pretty cool. This is what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I, could, I could sit here and talk a lot about psychedelics and the history of psychedelics, but I kind of figured you guys might know more about that than what I'm sharing with you today. So, um, is it click? Okay, so why do I call it tools for ascension? First, we have to understand what I mean by ascension. So this is just a typical dictionary definition of it. It's the act of rising to an important position or a higher level, okay? So you can ascend a staircase or a ladder, and you can see things from a different perspective. Rising to an important position, I guess I agree with that. It just It depends on what you mean is important. But the ascension process, there's many ways we have to clarify our terms. There's many things that we can uh, speak about when it comes to ascension. Okay, we could talk about uploading our consciousness to computers. There's a lot of people that believe this is going to be the, uh, the next level of human ascension, uploading your consciousness to a computer. Is it possible? I'm not gonna say yes or no, um, but there are some people that believe this is where we're heading, inevitably. Uh, is it being the ultimate problem solver so you can do the most epic game of Sudoku? or crossword puzzles, right? That's another thing that has to do with a form of ascension, is becoming a little bit more attuned to things like problem solving. 
Over here, you can either be like Neo and escape the, the matrix, the simulated reality that some people say we're in, or ascending in a spiritual way. Um, it could be literally just learning how to adapt to a new environment. Outer space, another planet, Mars. NASA's really talking about sending people to Mars. I'll be attending a human potential summit where they're talking to people who are into psychedelics and different human potential uh, topics because they want to know how to send people out, you know, basically for life, never to return to Earth. How will they psychologically deal with it? How will they physiologically deal with it? You know, knowing that they're, they're never going to see terrestrial, um, uh, you know, what, plant life, Earth, um, never going to see their family, extended family anymore. Is it peak human or is it peak physical and emotional command? These are all ways of explaining ways that we can ascend, but who's a, this is what Claire Graves said, and this is what I feel is the most important. It's practical practical way of understanding ascensions. Claire Graves talked about spiral dynamics. And if you look at this, you can look at it like a ladder. Individuals follow this, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Individuals follow this as well as um, civilizations follow this. So you could start survival all the way up to a, a holistic way of perceiving, a way of being, either as a group or as an individual. So I'm just gonna overly simplify this and say, if you're, let's say, a child at the beginning of your life and you're speaking with an adult that's, that's lived quite a few years in the 3D here, you may say that the adult has superior logic and the child has inferior logic. So the child just does not understand why you, you won't let them stick a fork into a light socket, right? They don't understand it. And you're trying to explain it to them and they're arguing with you, even though like you're racking your brain like, wait a minute, I'm the adult, I've been here, I have the superior logic, and you're trying to get this child to understand it. There's also Facebook and all the bickering that goes on on social media, and a lot of the times you'll see that some of the arguments are just useless. They're not really going anywhere. And a lot of the times it feels like there's people with superior and inferior logic that are communicating in two completely different ways. The way that I explain this is, if you have a higher perspective, and you're trying to explain something of a certain form of sophistication, somebody on a lower rung, they don't have the capacity to wrap their head around something so sophisticated, even though the language is the same. So they need to degrade the quality of the message down to their level. And then what they're arguing is not the superior logic. They're arguing something on par or lesser than their own logic. This is the idea behind, this is my understanding of the idea behind Claire Graves' spiral dynamics, whether it's for an individual or a species. But this is what I mean, is by maturing through our understanding, having been here, and sometimes when you're arguing with a child, we think we have superior logic, and then as a parent, sometimes you realize, whoa, like actually my child gets it more than I thought. So sometimes we, Go ahead. <laughs> Are you talking about superior logic in the sense of going from brain ego-centered thinking to heart? Well. Where you could help someone get there by opening your heart. Yes, that's, that's part of it. Now, I think like the, the intellect and heart-based intelligence, we have neurology in our heart. We have neurons in our gut. So I believe that the whole thing is the brain. And when I'm saying superior logic, I believe it's our ability to grasp complex, um, just complex situations, complex topics in ways, and I'm, when I say children, I believe that children also get things in ways that we sometimes are so convoluted by our own ideas and thoughts and in-the-box thinking that we need to come down to, to that level to truly understand. But I'm not saying superior logic as an analytical thing because I do believe superior logic actually does rest more so in the heart. But when I say that, I also mean that it's, it's a holistic form of logic that I believe. We can use the heart, we can use the gut, we can use even the thinking that our skin does, um, we can use the intellect, but it's the consciousness that uses these tools at their disposal. And I'll get into why I believe the artist is uh, the artist inside of us is really the salvation that we are typically 
always looking for. We have an inner scientist, we have an inner philosopher, and even though some people don't like this word, we have an inner religious form of intelligence. And relegare, the, that word, comes from to bind together. Kind of like Daniel LaRusso and Mr. Miyagi binding that um, bonsai tree back together, so it can be one. Yoga is also union, this, this bringing together. So I believe relegare comes from that, but religious institutions a lot of the times cause us to hate the word religion and want to step back from it. I believe that science is, is like um, the act of being able, the act to know, the word is to know. So that's bringing in raw information and it's just brass tacks. But when we receive data, when we receive information and stimuli, then the philosopher within us kicks in because we can't just sit idly by with information. We have to make sense of it, meaning of it. So the philosopher within us kicks in. And then we need to commit to something because when we have a philosophy, it doesn't just sit there idly by. We want to commit to do something about that. So that's the inner religious inside of us. And the artist is the one that carries it forth from that abstract inner knowing to an actual action in our behavior. That's what I mean when I say the artist, and I believe that the artist uses science, uses philosophy, and uses religion at its disposal, but it is not limited to any of those. So when you're speaking about what is superior logic, it's not an analytical thing, it's not purely a heart-based thing, or just a gut-centered thing. It has all of that at, at its disposal, but it's, it's the artist inside of us. <clears throat> This is just an example. We don't, we don't have to show this. Maybe afterwards we can show this just in the interest of time. But what this is, is a YouTube video where it's a jar of paint with a little hole in the bottom of it and a big piece of paper on the floor. And this guy just threw it and it started acting like a pendulum and going these circles. And this is what it creates trying to find home, trying to find center and balance. This is beautiful. This is something that you could almost say is... Um, it looks computer generated in a way. It's so precise. And the reason why I show this is because a lot of the times when we try to go into our ego and control what our path is going to be, a lot of the times, imagine this is just the natural path that this thing is taking to try and find that center. But if we were to try and force it to do this, it would look far sloppier. And this is just a, a random example that I can show to show that a lot of the times when we think we know what's best for us, when we think we know what's best for our world, our community, what our government should be doing, um, what our kids should be doing, where they, where they should go to school, what friends they should hang out with, oftentimes we are right, we can be right in that respect, but oftentimes we are stepping in the way of a natural process of learning, growth, okay? Go ahead. So what I believe is that we are all made of story. And this is quite al allegorical, and you have to understand it with a form of subtlety. But story, I believe, is the fabric of who we are. Because we can't impartially receive any data or information. It's always going to be reflected upon the context of who and what we are based upon our lineage, based upon our culture, Nowadays, like uh, our, the, the time and the place in which we are born, everything is contextual. So there's this global or uh, let's say universal story playing out. And I like the word universe. Some people, it's, it's not the exact definition of it, but uni and verse, one song. Patterns nested within patterns nested within patterns. That is the song of the universe and we are a component of that beautiful song. But this is storytelling. Music is storytelling. A sculpture is storytelling. You could sit silently in a chair and you're still telling a story somehow. You can try and remove yourself from any kind of communication whatsoever. And in a way, you, you might hear that inaction is still a form of action. It's still a decision. You're still deciding something and it's a bodily action, a mental decision. I like Arthur C. Clarke. I, I really want to talk a lot about magic tonight and the real understanding of magic. Not Hollywood magic, and interestingly enough, Hollywood, the wood of the holly tree, is, is what magic wands typically were made out of, but we're talking about storytelling. 
using visuals, using the audiovisual arts. And he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, sometimes that's, that's a hard one to understand because a lot of things can be considered technology. 500 years ago, this might have been considered magic. You know, what we do with this might have been considered magic. Nowadays, it's the mundane. So why is it magic then and mundane now? Because we get the mechanics of it more now. It's a sufficiently advanced technology, but it's still a technology. Magic is the use of natural forces. It's real. They're subtle forces, but it is the harnessing of natural forces and bending them. We are transformers of energy. We can't not be. Everything that we do, we're metabolizing, we're thinking. Our thoughts and everything, and I'll get into this a little later, show up on our skin. So everything we are is emanating from us. And I believe story is the most timeless and enduring technology, and it is in the domain of the artist. And we are all telling our stories. Every action, every word that comes out of our mouth, everything we decide to do is a part of our story. So, I mean, what is the role of the artist? Is it to tell the truth? Anyone see something at the top of the screen there? Come on. I was hoping you guys, obviously it's not Joe Pesci from Star Wars, it's Samuel L. Jackson from Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> what is the role of the artist? Is it to tell the truth? I mean, then we have to start defining what is truth. What are we talking about when we're talking about truth? When we say, oh, well, truth are the facts. Well, when you're reading facts in a book, are those facts? Or is it something that was told to you? Is it something that you can draw back on? You can access it as a tool to make more informed decisions. These are very flexible boundaries of what I'm talking about. But I think that a better artist uses questions. Because that root word question, quest, to quest after something. When you have a question, again, you can't sit idly by. We like to have some kind of closure. This is why when... When we see something that may be a paradox to us, we'll fill in the gaps. We'll make up the story in our own minds. And this is well documented when, uh, what do they call that, when people uh, line up and you're, you're picking out, you know, which one committed the crime, a, a, a lineup or something like that. Eyewitness document or um, testimony oftentimes, very often, is not accurate. So what I'm saying with this is a better artist allows for the realizations to happen within the audience. So an artist coming up with a story, or let's say even a, a, somebody has a thesis. Well, in your paper, you want to include an antithesis. What is the argument? That way the synthesis happens inside the audience member. Because, thank you, because if, it's not that. If you're telling what the synthesis is, then it's on the nose, as they say. It's like when you're writing a screenplay and you have the angry dad come in and slam something down on the table and say, I'm mad. You don't need to say, I'm mad. It's too on the nose, and that doesn't follow the rule, show me, don't tell me. Right? So what I'm saying here is the best form of art really provokes more questions. It provokes more inquiry inside of us. And the better we can get at formulating our questions, the, the more direct our quest and our path might be. And again, I believe that all paths, no matter what, lead us inside. They lead us within to a better understanding of ourselves. Aho. So here's my assumption. That the body, the human body, is the most sophisticated technology known to man. Get it? Man. Anyway, um, that when disciplined can alter reality. Now, we just had a subtle example of that with the breath technique. But I'm here to tell you that no matter what, every decision, every action that we make, we are changing our neurochemistry and, and our hormonal balance. The reason why we, what I believe, I do believe there is such a thing called sobriety. But I believe that sobriety is different for every individual depending upon what time of day you wake up, 
what you do first thing in the morning. Do you take a shower or do you go and get a cup of coffee? Do you eat or do you not eat? Do you do your exercise or do you just sit and start doing work? All of these things are going to augment you in a subtle way. So we don't earn the keys to this right away. We don't, we're not born, maybe we are in some ways, but the reason why all of us can't just say, well, when I'm, when I'm scared, oh, just calm down your heart rate and bam, it just happens. Or when you're cold, oh, well, just warm up and bam, it happens. Well, we don't earn the, well, we have to earn the keys. We don't just have the keys to this incredible technology because in some ways, if we knew how brilliant we were, if we knew how much we are actually immature magicians finding our way towards our, our maturity, if we didn't have the discipline to get us there, I believe we could cause a lot more damage than good. All right, so what I'm offering are practical tips to not just see, but to utilize the mundane things in our world, such as breath. We're doing it all day long, but when we control it, when we actually bring our conscious will into it, it gives us a very, very different outcome. So all I'm going to be offering here are practical tips that I've found through my journeys. I started, uh, I didn't give an intro here, but um, back in 2000, well, let's start earlier. Back in, when I was 14, I started doing mushrooms and LSD, and that kept me from doing what all of my other friends were doing, which was Oxycontin, the heavier pills, heroin, because I instantly knew that there was something about these plants that seemed to open and turn on consciousness rather than dimming it down. So I started young, but around 2008, I started going down to the Amazon to do ayahuasca, and it was a whole new world for me. And what that means is I realized that as I'd done many psychedelics in the past, that set and setting was so crucial. So any of these practices that I'm going to offer today, they are highly enhanced by set and setting. So I'm, everyone knows what set and setting is. I don't have to go through it. Okay, cool. Now, I wanted to start with this quote because it's so poetic, I almost didn't believe that it was Albert Einstein, but he says, we are slowed down sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned into the cosmos. We are, uh, we are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. Right, right? I almost want to say it again, but I'll just, I'll leave it for effect, right? <clears throat> yeah, please. And so I'm just going to point out a couple things here. We have all these organs and these weird squishy things inside of us, and um, there's many things we can do. Eat, not eat. Talk, not talk. Wake up, not wake up. Stand up, not stand up. Everything that we do will start changing in subtle or not so subtle ways the biochemical makeup inside of our bodies. So I believe that the brain is not just this thing up here, it is the entire apparatus. It's connected with fascia all throughout our body. Our skin seems to be able to think and produce um, many different neurochemicals on its own according to what's happening around us. Um, but if you look at these up here, what are chemical compounds? Every single atom in there has an atomic weight a resonance, a frequency, a tone. So a chemical compound is very interesting because to me, now I'm not a chemist, but to me, what these compounds are, are a composition of different frequencies, like a chord on a piano, a very complex chord being played within our bodies. Okay? And all of these ones, as you see, they all have benzene rings and these little forked tails. I'll get into that in a little bit. But up here, why do we have neurology that sends electronic messages, but then it stops so it can turn into these chemical compounds only to be picked up again to turn back into an electronic message? Does anyone have any ideas on that? I don't either, so we can, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, these look like boom boxes to me, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm it's, it's also the image, right? Somebody created this image. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it has to communicate it, right? In the same way that I'm communicating. Like, I have my ideas and my concepts, 
and I have to work on being able to formulate it in language that people that I've never met will understand, right? And there's some kind of interchange that's happening. We are all in the same room, we, we exchange the same breath, and now we're starting to congeal around the same ideas. Even though we're all different, and th when my words re are received by you, they're going to be slightly different than what I intended them. But there's something about this to me that I have to create sounds with my voice to hit your intellect, right, in, that, in such a way. But when we're talking about light, these are also frequencies. So let me, just, let me just show you something. If I were to be, you know, trying to speak to you without speaking to you, there's this, and then there's this, right? You know, a dog would be able to understand the difference between and I didn't say anything. I hardly made a noise. But that's us speaking in our own way. So there's, there's kind of like, there's a subtle difference between this and this. And the impact inside the body, I'll get into it a little later, but the subtle difference between this and this in our posture creates hormonal changes inside the body that are profound. And that's what I'm trying to get at is how profound it is when we take command of our body and we understand that those little things add up over time. They're cu accumulative and they actually sit in the fabric of our body. They sit in the fascia, especially because we sit so much and we have all of us in the world have tight hip flexors. That's where a lot of fascia doesn't get a lot of movement. So new water, new fluids don't get passed through it. Water holds memory. And when we have trauma, it does store itself in the body in places. Trauma, which needs uh, a form of healing, something that we enact to be able to loosen. And the same thing with breath, breathing, loosens the, the fascial fabric and actually allows for new water to move into our fascia. So I'm not going to go too nerdy on you about that, but what I'm saying is these subtle differences between our architecture, our primal architecture, and the way we sit, the way we stand, the way we speak, the way we use our voice, the way we move, the grace in which we use our, this body poetry, right? All of that is extremely profound and it's accumulative. So why psychedelics? Well. When I'm speaking about story, and we are all in the fabric of story, when I'm speaking about story, one thing that can break you out of your boxed way of thinking is psychedelics. And I won't get too deeply into the science behind it, but one thing that happens in the brainstem is there's a novelty center that kind of fires off. And you can, uh, with brain imaging, you can see that it fires off when new things are perceived even when you think you're perceiving something new. Because you've seen your hand before. We've all seen our hands. Have well, you ever done psychedelics and look at your hand? <laughs> you ever looked at the back of a $20 bill on weed? <laughs> right? It changes the way we see things. So you can stare at your hand that you've seen so many times before and you can see it in a new way. You can stare at a flower that you pass by all the time, but on mushrooms you'd be like, whoa. This is so beautiful, and you can appreciate some of the nuances that become mundane to us in everyday life, especially when we are on a mission to do something. Like, I need to get from point A to point B, so we don't see anything in between, anything that we don't want to see, unless it's very, very loud. Psychedelics, meditation, breathing techniques, cold showers, long walks on the beach, many of these things that we do that we say, oh, I'm going for a walk to clear my head, or I'm doing psychedelics to clear my head, or I'm going to jump in a cold bath to clear my head. What it does is it destabilizes the default mode network. My understanding of the default mode network is it's brain regions, hubs of the brain, that communicate with one another, and they consume a lot of energy. They're consuming a lot of energy, but the interesting thing is, is you would imagine that such a demanding task on the brain must be for something extremely important, extremely imperative. But it seems that typically the default mode network is typified by when we are 
pondering about things that are quite shallow. Like, I wonder what that person over there is thinking right now. I wonder what yada yada is going to do when they open my email. I wonder what this dog is thinking right now, right? These things that don't really make a huge impact in our life, these shallower things, ruminating, self-dialogue, anything but the core questions that don't even happen intellectually. These things, when you're meditating, I believe you're getting to the core of who you are without having to go up into the intellect and think about who you are. Same thing was why I'm here, what am I to do with my time here? These are the core questions, but these don't seem to happen well or in good quality when we're in our default mode network. Manly Palmer Hall was an occultist. He was awarded 33 deg uh, 33rd degree Freemasonry. And from my understanding, he was never a Freemason. He was awarded it because of all the books that he was writing and how close to what they believe the, that truth really is. Here's one of my favorite quotes by him. It is said that wisdom lies not in seeing things, but seeing through things. Meaning, we all see the same room right now. We can see all the same faces right? Slightly different perspectives. But what's the underlying pattern of it? This is what allows us to, to, to be able to acknowledge when somebody's lying to us. Or when, let's say, um, an underlying pattern would be, you know, after the third or fourth time that this person said they were going to do something and there was always an excuse, we start wondering, like, what does that mean? You're starting to see an underlying pattern, right? So wisdom lies not in the phenomena, not in the temporal, the things that are ever-changing, but in that seemingly unchanging fabric underneath. Parasites, very interesting. I know it's kind of gross. I don't want to get into it too much, but understand that there are parasites that cause mice to love cats, right? so they can get eaten by cats, not because the mice wanted it, but because the parasite needed to start its next phase of reproduction inside the cat. Pretty intelligent. How does a little creature get a big creature to make a decision like that? What kind of intelligence is that? There's also this uh, interesting parasite called Gandhi. It's spelt different, and it's Gandhi something. Is that what it was? Yeah and usually infects the trigger fish. And trigger fish are typically, they, they sw most fish don't like to swim too close to the surface because of birds. Well, this parasite causes them to swim very erratically, very noticeably up towards the surface, so they can get picked up by a bird, not to be inside the bird, but what, what's been found out is they drop their droppings over fields that are sometimes ungulate animals, bovine creatures, cows that will go and graze, and then that parasite gets a, uh, a five-star hotel inside one of the four stomachs of that cow, and that's where it lives out the remainder of its life. So it causes creatures. So think about that. You can't really see that with, you know, on the human scale. You can't really see these things happening, but if you see the underlying pattern of it, you're starting to get closer to the truth. Now, Marcus Tullius Cicero said, a nation can survive its fools, and we are not without our fools. I don't believe that uh, uh, any time in history we've been without our fools, and I believe that we can learn a lot from our fools, and we should be learning a lot from our fools. But he said, even the ambitious you can survive from, but it cannot survive treason from within. Now, I'm not just talking about physical parasites. I'm not just talking about physical parasites. I'm talking about the lies we tell ourselves, the narrative that we are trapped within, the things that we tell ourselves so we don't have to challenge what's possible, what's impossible. Because a lot of the times, you may hear this, and if you go deep enough into your psychedelic practice, you'll realize that we are capable of so much more, and that sometimes is what scares us, our own power. Not our weakness, but it's our power that scares us. Go ahead. So, to me, I just want, this is a little practice that we're going to do. I just want you to think, and sometimes it's hard in a setting like this, this quickly, to think of what you find to be impossible. Try and think of something that you want or wish to be possible that you believe is impossible. 
And you don't have to say it out loud or anything. Just try and bring something up. And if you can't, it's fine. It's fine. We'll get there. I don't know. Uh, if you can't think of anything, I have no answer. And I don't know why I left it at that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but go ahead. Here's another Arthur C. Clarke. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. It doesn't serve us to believe in the impossible. It really doesn't serve us to believe in the impossible. It may act as a governor to keep us from doing things that are extremely dangerous, but a lot of the times it does not serve us to believe in the impossible. To reserve judgment is probably a lot healthier way, all right? So believe everything and nothing at the same time and you have the capacity to go any which way. It can be maddening sometimes, such as psychedelics can be very maddening. You don't know what's up, down, right, wrong. You don't even know who you are anymore sometimes in these difficult states. But a lot of the times, oftentimes, if you spend enough time experiencing psychedelics, if you can get over the, the shock and awe of it all, you might realize that your concepts of what is real, what is not real, what is possible, what is not possible, start to bend and shift. It's too traumatizing to go from zero to 60. So I believe that our practice and our discipline in psychedelics, in breath practice, in all these tools that I'll be sharing with you, to go at your own pace. And if you start feeling like it's starting to become really, really difficult for you. The beautiful thing about breath practice is you can dial it back a little bit. But the great thing about psychedelics is they're highly non-toxic. And you have to take quite a bit of them to get to a toxic level of them. The dangers are typically what happens to our psychological state. Good. Now we're starting to get into some of the practices. We're going to start challenging what's possible and impossible. And I wanted to start with quantum phenomena. The interesting thing about quantum phenomena is you could take your human scale hand, at the human scale, you magnify this thing 10 billion times and you'll get down to the atomic scale. That's where we receive a lot of our understanding of physics. And when you look at physics, there are certain paradoxes in our general understanding of physics. And in, that, in those paradoxes, we sometimes just as academia, we're just like, okay, well, we know there are paradox, but there's got to be a, a, a way to understand this, right? But if you take that same hand and you magnify it one trillion trillion times, you will start getting down to the Planck scale phenomena. And the interesting thing about that is you will notice that you're finding particles and waves, but what does something exist as, a particle or a wave? Well, sometimes we notice that it can exist in both states, and then it, like, let's say a wave will collapse into a particle depending upon the observer's expectations of it. The reason why I'm speaking about this to a psychedelic um, group is because how many of you have sat in ceremony with, with other people, many other people? Okay, have any of you felt like you were all on the same wavelength, right? Sometimes, you're having the same thoughts, you're having the same visuals as other people, you're thinking the same things. You don't have to be on psychedelics. This happens to me all the time in a sober state. But there's something interesting about that. Like I was saying earlier on, there's this wave that we can ride, and that is when we are all connected on the same wavelength. We're in the flow, as they say. And then the particle is typically when it's not anymore in its potential state, it has collapsed into a manifested state. And as that particle, it's like an island. It already is. It's, it's no longer potential. It is in that. And that is kind of what I believe ego seems to be. When we are in our ego, we believe that we are this disconnected, not a part of the ocean, but we are just the drop. We're disconnected from one another. And in that, I believe that the ego might be this uh, underlying invisible parasite that we're dealing with. I believe, if any of you have seen the movie Chimatica, right? So um, I speak about, in that film, I speak about a global parasite, something that is affecting us as a species. You can call it ego, but I don't even think ego is necessarily a bad thing. 
It's a way to experience separation, which is really beautiful. It's a really beautiful thing to be able to experience our individuality. It How helps if we all know we're experiencing it so that we can choose. Right, right. And I believe that these experiences, they help us acknowledge that we can walk between the worlds. Now, if you think about it, shamans were always said to walk between the worlds, bring back information from the other world, be able to travel dimensions to see where the game was going to be next season, right? Things that today were kind of like, come on, these are just stories, right? Anyone ever hear of Stuart Hameroff and Sir Roger Penrose? Okay, Stuart Hameroff is an anesthesiologist and he studies the microtubules inside the, the brain, inside the neurons. There's more microtubules than there are neurons and the interesting thing about that is we're starting to find out that the microtubules account for quantum consciousness, being able to tune into Planck scale phenomena. And there's a lot of evidence for this. Sir Roger Penrose um, didn't get as much into the microtubule theory, but once he met Stuart Hameroff, he's like, okay, this seems to have a lot of weight. The interesting thing about that is, is like, imagine what shamans were for, since time immemorial. Quantum wave surfers. Potentially, I mean, if this theory is correct, Potentially, what that means is when you are accessing, when you are going into these realms, even with breathing techniques, and you're endogenously producing these compounds, that you are accessing the Planck scale phenomena, meaning things in their potential state before they manifest themselves. Now we're talking about magic. And I know, go ahead. Um, when you mentioned Chimastica and the whole uh, parasite mm -hmm. thing, was I was so impressed with how you had figured out the same thing I had been teaching for 10 years about the ego as the biggest parasite, but also the research on parasites literally um, controlling your thoughts and your behavior. And the book I was using at the time, I titled it Pimp by Parasites, and the students thought it was hilarious. Um, but it, it is so un... Um, people are so unaware of that dance between the literal parasites and the ego as the, the big parasite. Mm. Yeah, scale, yeah. how big things are and how small things are. Typically, when you think of the Illuminati or, or cults or whatever that, that seem to pray to demons and things, we think of these grandiose, huge beings. Well, I mean, it could be that. It could also be these parasites. I mean, we, we could already be, you know, taken over by alien forces. I mean, I, I love, I'm a filmmaker, guys. I'm not from academia. So, I mean, I, I take artistic license when I go out there and speculate. And I do speculate a lot. So, um, don't believe any of this bullshit. <laughs> right? I, I smoke a lot of pot. So, <laughs> um, with that being said, I really, uh, I, I try not to just speculate out the wazoo. I really do. Uh, I, w I was called by somebody when I was doing Limitless, I was called by somebody who was trying to insult me, an armchair researcher. And I thought, what a nice compliment, because that's my favorite place to do my research, is in the armchair, you know what I mean? So, no, I don't have any letters behind my name. I don't, I don't subscribe to any one field of, um, of uh, inquiry, I respect all of them and I think it takes a tribe. You know, I don't think that any one person really has all the answers. I think the answer really is between the community and it really is in our bond of love. Our communities coming together, a lot of the times, oftentimes, Michael Winkleman talks about psychoneuroimmunology is the reason why we come together as a group is because it makes our immune system robust. There's something about that. Go ahead. Parasitic ego. N enough said. I just wanted to show you guys what it looks like. So, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> when we're talking about what's impossible, Roger Bannister broke the first recorded four minute mile because I'm pretty sure Native Americans were doing that long before this guy did it. But academia was saying you can't. Your heart would explode. Your lungs will collapse, your grammar will get worse, right? <laughs> Roger did it in unfavorable conditions. 
John Landy was the guy who came closest before that, and he said it's a brick wall. You just can't pass it. And guess what? Once he did it, John Landy was like, fuck that. 46 days later, he ended up beating John Roger Bannister's record. I think three years later, there was like 300 people that had done it. Now there's thousands of people that have broken the four minute mile, even teenagers, right? So what was that impossibility wall, as Paul Check says? What was that impossibility wall? The belief. We are governed so much by what we choose to believe. I'm not, I, I'm not saying that if you choose to believe, like, uh, what was it, General Stubblebein said, like, I don't believe that that wall really exists, and he tried to walk through the wall, and he smacked his face against it, right? It takes discipline to tear down these walls. You can't just say, well, I think it's, I know it's possible to do a four-minute mile. Many of us wouldn't be able to do it, even though we know that it's been done. It takes discipline. And this is the one thing when people are saying, well, psychedelics get you to the same place that meditation does, so why, why meditate? Because discipline, your meditative and your breathwork disciplines build your body, if you will. Build the vessel that allows you the maturity to know what to do in those spaces. All right? Uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, by the way, Donald Abram said that the runner's high used to be attributed to endorphins, but... The endocannabinoid system sits on top of other systems regulating it. It's actually an endocannabinoid thing. So apparently, you know, you don't even have to smoke it, right? <laughs> Anyone know who this guy is? <laughs> the Hoffman. I love this guy. He's Dutch. My wife is Dutch. I got to go to meet this dude in Holland at his house. We went swimming in his pool in January. Uh, and it was just phenomenal. This is the real deal. The real deal. He's not doing all this shit for show. He's breaking down impossibility walls. Academia said you cannot control your autonomic nervous system. He does some breath techniques and he does it. Doctor said you, you swim in Arctic water and your heart, you're gonna have a heart attack, right? No one's that badass, not even Chuck Norris. And he said, Chuck Norris, never heard of her. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. That was on his, uh, on his page. You know, he, look at him. He looks like he's chilling watching TV. He needs like a towel to, to wipe the sweat off his brow, right? This guy is the real deal, but he's, his biggest mission is to show that everyone can do this. So he had 12 people, 12 of his students, do the breathing technique, and then there was a control group. They were all injected with E. coli. Sounds like a great party. <laughs> Everyone who was not doing the breathing technique were having convulsions, got extremely sick. Nobody that was doing the breathing technique felt a thing. Nobody that was doing this breathing technique felt a thing. What does that mean? You gotta do the breathing technique to find out what that really means. It seriously, it does something to you. You know, a lot of times when you start feeling the tingling, you're feeling like this is not natural, I shouldn't be doing this. Same thing that happens when you're running and you're like, that pain protein isn't decoupled yet and you're just like, what, I can't do this anymore. And then you get past that wall and that pain protein isn't telling you no anymore. And you feel like you could run another 10 miles. Well, these things are well within our reach. And so far, air is still free. <clears throat> this is what happens to Wim Hof's brain, is periaqueductal gray matter, the PAG, starts oscillating at one wavelength. His insula dampens and starts oscillating at a different wavelength, complementary, and it produces endocannabinoids and opioids. Think of, for decades and decades, this dude's been doing this breathing technique. He's federally illegal in most countries. He's produced so many drugs inside him, TSA won't let him pass, right? <clears throat> it's just interesting that these compounds that we endogenously produce have such a pr profound effect on us. Go ahead. So I was really trying to find women when I was looking for savants, but actually it is shown, at least the almighty Google says, that there are far less women that seem to become savants than men. I think that's probably because women are already smarter than us. Um, 
But what I found when I was looking through all the, I, the term used to be idiot savants, and that's because usually they, they're not as socially functional in some ways, and then they're just far beyond whatever we could imagine. So I call them savants. This guy, uh, Kim Peek, they call him Kim Pewter, can remember meticulous detail from 12,000 books that he's read. Rain Man was modeled after this guy. Orlando Sorrell was struck by a baseball. And afterwards, after the headaches and everything went away, he noticed that he had incredible math and visual memory. The, what he's drawing right here is a city that he was flown over for about 30 minutes in a helicopter. And then he came down and started drawing it. Incredible, impeccable detail, where doors were, where buildings were facing. Let's not all go out and try and get struck by a baseball. There's other ways of sharpening that blade, if you will. But this guy over here, Daniel Kish, he went blind early on in life and his parents were like, we're not going to let you just feel sorry for yourself and, and disadvantage yourself by that. So there, he's been on TED Talks and stuff like that. So he starts going as he's walking around and he's echolocating like a bat. He's echolocating. There's this video where he's walking through this gondola or a big uh, gazebo and he's just and he's like, okay, there's something over here, there's something right here, there's something right there. And he goes and he draws it out to show where all the pillars were and, and he showed that there's something up with the ceiling, I don't get it. And it was corrugated, right? He could sense all of that meticulous detail. Well, the thing is, is we have our eyes, it may not behoove us to try and learn how to echolocate. It may not serve us the way it serves him. So this is showing that we don't need to be, we don't need to have every superpower in the world, but it's showing you that these aren't special people. They don't have special DNA. They don't come from special families. They're people under special circumstances, but they're ordinary people that had to in, in some way, shape, or form, well, I mean, maybe not Kim, uh, Kim Peek, he was born that way, but these are ordinary people that had to sharpen the blade of some kind of tool. And these are things that you would, you would hear about in Hollywood movies. It's incredible, but it's possible. So again, we need to question what is possible? What does that word mean? Here's that guy I was telling you about, the endogenous production of DMT. The book is called Questions for the Lion Tamer. He's saying that the endogenous DMT production inside our body might account for remote viewing, ESP, telekinesis, telepathy, regrowth of limbs, and what Wim Hof is showing us. The interesting thing about this is a 2019 study came out. I'm sure you guys have heard of Rick Strassman, DMT the spirit molecule. There's a lot of people saying, whoa, this is way too speculative. Like, why are we talking about trace amounts of DMT um, when we could be talking about all these other cascades of neurochemicals that seem to augment our perception? Well, in 2019, out of the University of Michigan, Jimo Borjigan's team found that DMT levels free floating in the cerebral spinal fluid are equal to serotonin, <coughs> serotonin and I believe norepinephrine. So this is brand new. Now this, uh, Jimo Berjigan's team has, has looked at all different kinds of, uh, actually, they, they were looking at the Wim Hof breathing as well. And, um, and just in 2019, we're finding new things about the whole brain produces DMT. We produce the, uh, the enzyme that produces DMT in the lungs. We produce DMT in our eyes. We potentially produce it in our gut. And I'm working with this guy on a film docu-series that will actually go to GMO's team and start taking this further. We're looking for funding to actually take this further to see how far we can push this envelope. Like, he's calling it endowaska because we don't just produce DMT, we produce whole cascades of the, some of the similar things that you will find in ayahuasca. But we produce it ourselves. Back to that Terrence McKenna quote, I am drugs. Go ahead. Aubrey Marcus goes into a cave for seven days because melatonin starts to decrease after you've been in dark for very long, and penaline and MAOI starts to increase. DMT probably starts to increase, and that's ayahuasca. And MAOI and DMT is ayahuasca. This guy's pretty cool because um, 
he's got a really cool podcast and he featured Nako. If you guys haven't heard of Nako, you should check out his music. All right, Nako and Medicine for the, for the People. Um, next one. So in, yeah, changing your environment changes that internal chemical makeup. Go ahead. So practical tools. I'm gonna try and push through this and this way we can actually do something a little bit more interactive again, kind of like the breath. So the, uh, a timeless art only changes its outer form. All these breathing techniques, they've been around forever. Going into darkness, the Kogi people in, um, it's not Venezuela, it's Colombia, the Kogi people, sometimes some of them spend nine years of their formative years in darkness, experiencing a lot of neurochemical shifts. Okay, now I'm gonna start moving a little quicker through this. Look how intricate this configuration of musculature is. Remember when I was saying that subtle changes in your posture or your body language are very noticeable to people? You can tell an inauthentic smile from an authentic smile. But the interesting thing as well is when you give an authentic smile, it produces different hormones than if you give an inauthentic smile. So authentically smiling, with the, the Botox is this thing that you can inject into your face and then you have, it paralyzes some of the facial muscles so you can't emote that well. Well, Meg Ryan and Nicole Kidman are finding out that they can't do any acting with it because they can't move their face for sure, but they also said that they were experiencing some depression and some anxiety beforehand and the Botox knocked it out. Like it's another antidepressant. So there's something retrograde. It's not just your depression will cause you to droop and frown. If you can't droop and frown, your body actually has trouble producing the neurochemistry and the hormones to make you feel those feelings. So a lot of the times we are just enraptured by the sensations of the chemicals in our body and we translate that as, I'm sad, I'm anxious. And it can make you sad and anxious. But I find that really, really beautiful that our body is so sophisticated that just the slightest subtle changes, like think of cops that can interrogate you and they watch your eyes to see whether you're telling the truth or not. The body is constantly speaking its own language. So the more we come in tune with our body and the more we're authentic with these things, the more we'll start realizing that we do have command over what chemicals, we have those keys to this beautiful vehicle here. Our skin is a reflex organ. This is a guy before war and after war. He was trying to smile the same way or to just give the same face. Not a huge difference, but if you look at it, you can tell. There's subtle differences, but you can tell. Something happened. You wear that on your skin. Go ahead. I don't know. I, I didn't think they did one in the middle. I didn't think they did one when they were at, uh, it, was, it was a woman photographer and she did a bunch of people. Um, I don't know what the middle picture is, but I think it's obviously the process. It's like maybe beginning, middle and end, but I was told uh, from what I read, I should say, um, there weren't any pictures taken in the middle of the process. So that's a good question, but you can tell something happened here. Right? And this is how we can tell when like somebody that you are attuned to, like your child or your lover, comes home and something's slightly off. Just slightly. You can still tell. And we may even chalk it up to, well, I'm just, I just have a hunch or it's just your vibe. A lot of the times, it's the subtleties that we don't even realize we're picking up on. These are all the chemicals that your skin produces. Your skin produces it. There are people who are saying there's a brain in our skin. It's connected with our fascia, which is connected with our nervous system, right? And pretty much everything seems to be some kind of cycle of itself. Everything is connected to something else. So you cannot avoid showing your, your thoughts, your emotions on your skin. I don't believe you can avoid that. And I've been to some shamans that have been able to tell that there's something going on with my prostate or my, my bladder looking into my eyes. And you hear about iridology and sclerology, but there's some incredible practices out there that we would say are impossible or just woo-woo, when really 
Saying it's impossible does not serve us. We will never learn if we just say something's impossible without testing that boundary. <laughs> Amy Cuddy showed that two minutes of hands above head, right, with shoulders down, two minutes of this makes cortisol, the stress hormone, go down. It makes testosterone go up. So why is she showing somebody at their desk? Because she was training people to do this before interviews for jobs, before board meetings, before a difficult conversation. Because there's something about testosterone that makes us feel like we're allowed to take up our allotted space, to take up our allotted time, to speak our mind. And there's something about when you look at these two different postures over here. Imagine it's the same person and they were both fired or let's say they're twins, whatever, and they were fired. One of them stands there, it's almost giving the posture like, okay, but you're wrong, you made a mistake, good luck. The other one is like, you're right, All right? Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the physiology of that. What happens, this is called the hyperkyphosis. I focus a lot on posture, but this is called the hyperkyphosis. Uh, the natural curvature of the spine is called kyphosis. A hyperkyphosis, is that the hips start going out towards the, the toes. The, um, yeah, so this sways out, the back sways back and your head tilts forward. Now there's something about this that, um, maybe go to the next slide, this will give a better example of it. Here's a new cult and they have these postures, and it's, it's this, right? And when you lean your head forward, look, 60 pounds of pressure that the rest of your body has to compensate for. Now, there are studies out of Portland that are saying that this hyperkyphosis causes for a collapsing of the chest into the diaphragm, cutting off up to 30% of your oxygen. Now imagine if we were to take 30% of the oxygen out of this room. What do you think some of the effects would be? What do we start feeling? Less energy, anxiety, tired. It's gonna start changing things. Imagine if we're always like this. We sit more than ever before in history. This is our favorite posture now. We used to, hunter-gatherers, uh, every time I talk about posture, I see people like, you know what I mean? And that's perfect because you wanna bring more mindfulness to it. But we sit more than any other posture, hours and hours and hours and hours a day. This has a hormonal and chemical makeup to it. So when you take what Amy Cuddy was saying, two minutes, of hands above head has a testosterone raise and a cortisol lowering. What do you think hours and hours and hours a day of this and that do to us? It's gotta have some effect. Nothing we do has no effect. Has she, has she looked into dancers, ballet dancers particularly, which is their position all the time, shoulders down, arms up? I don't know. I don't know if she checked into that. What she shows are a lot of athletes and also how this is very natural for kids. Like my one-year-old boy, when he took his first couple steps, hands above the head, like, like holy shit, I did it, right? There's something about this. It's innate. And it's beautiful to see that. It's beautiful to see it, especially like people who just like won a race or something in sports. They have that, ah, they're so in the moment. There's something very natural about that. Also, it's unfurling this posture. That's one thing that this is, is the unfurling of it. And one issue, just so you guys know, it's not good to do this. It's not good to overcorrect, all right? But I won't go too deeply into posture. Just imagine, posture in movement is called form, and it's also called, like, with walking, it's called the gait cycle, right? But now we can look back into older disciplines and appreciate a little bit more, like this is not Shiva, this is the prototype of Shiva from the Indus Valley. And if you guys, just a quick history thing on, uh, they hit 4,000 years ago, present day Uzbekistan, right on the Silk Road, Bactria Margiana archeological complex, two football fields in length, have these giant vats where they were making some kind of brew with cannabis, poppy, and ephedra. Ephedra, methamphetamines. Poppy, opium. Cannabis, cannabis. Right? And together, they were making these massive amounts of this beverage, probably Soma and Hayoma, according to the, the archaeological Serenati, uh, Victor Serenati. Um, 
this brew probably made it all over the Silk Road. So interesting form of, of history. And this was that civilization there. And nobody really knows what happened. That whole factory thing, there was a fire and it just was empty for then thousands of years. But our history with these things goes back very, very long. Mike Crowley wrote a book, um, Secret Drugs and Buddhism, showing that psychedelics were used in Tantra, psychedelics were used in meditation, psychedelics were used with mantra and chanting. So these things have been used for a long time. They're a part of our social fabric. So has movement, so has breath technique, so has visualization, so has mantra. Let's go to the next one. Aha, this is what I was waiting for. When you were mentioning mantra, there's a bone inside the skull called the sphenoid bone. Kind of looks like an owl or a moth or a monarch butterfly. Lunesta is this drug that helps you sleep, right? And this whole complex houses the pituitary gland. There's this thing right here called the cella torsica, and you can see it up there, right where that pituitary gland, the, the arrow is pointing. That little cup is called the mercy seat, is the, is the cella torsica inside the sphenoid bone. Now, proper gait cycle allows for, and gait cycle is just the way you walk, functionally, allows for the sphenoid bone to flex, and it causes like a milking or a, a palpation to the pituitary gland that has positive downstream effects. Improper gait cycle, not walking correctly, impinges uh, or infringes or you know, whatever, uh, obstructs the ability for that flexion. Another th interesting thing is, and I, I'd like to do this now, but if you sh see where it is up here, behind the eyes, the optic chiasm, the optic nerves go through this, up above the, uh, above the mouth and inside the temples. That's where the sphenoid bone sits. So we're gonna ohm a couple times together and we're gonna try and get into the same tone. But what I want you to do is to feel where the resonance happens. You'll probably feel it in your teeth. You'll feel it up around in your skull, but you're really gonna feel it right there in the sphenoid bone. And that John Chavez guy, and I have been talking about this, and it seems like ohming and chanting vibrates the sphenoid bone and causes for different neurochemical ratios to emerge. Interesting thing about that. Now, we're gonna do it a couple times. We won't feel the effects that you'd feel if you were to do this for hours, but imagine yogis doing this for hours at a time, okay? Just imagine, after a couple times, you'll see it just deepens and deepens and deepens the process. Now what I want you to try and do when, as we do this practice is see where you can throw the resonance. You can actually change by where, how your tongue is seated where the resonance goes in your, in your cranium, okay? And I'll start with one ohm and then we'll go into the next one. times. Uh, two more times and play with it. can hear different harmonics happening with the same note, undertones, overtones. Could any of you, did any of you successfully feel that you could change where you felt the vibration in your skull? 
Wasn't that cool? Did you do it with the tongue? Right? Right? Yeah. I, I, I've done it in a couple different ways, um, but the tongue seems to be the best way to kind of, the tongue and intention. I intend it to go back there. Sometimes I feel like in some of the, the asymmetry that this eye seems a lot more lively than that eye, right? You know, so I try and like send vibrations up there and just feel it. I don't know what that's ever going to do, but it's interesting that we can do that. Now go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Chimatica stands for cymatics. If you ever heard of the science of pumping a frequency into a medium, like if this were a metal plate and you have sand on top of it, on top of it and you pump a frequency in, it'll start changing into geometric patterns. The higher you go, it'll go from order to chaos to higher order, to chaos to higher order. Every single time you go from one to the next. And it's pretty interesting because a lot of the times as we're having these moments where we feel like our life is falling apart, sometimes that's our life getting ready to reorganize on that spiral dynamic ladder in a way we can't conceive of, that ascension process. I believe that all these practices have been in place specifically for this, to break us out of that default mode, to be able to get us to conceptualize things that we've conditioned ourselves away from being able to accept, all right? Chimatic in the brain is what I'm talking about. That vibration is going into the wetware of your brain, causing vibrations and impregnating it with information, all right? So I just, I use these images because they're really cool to look at. Question? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I was just gonna ask, do you think, how, how important do you think, think it is, the specific chant of home versus, let's say, a vowel sound or some of the other, you know, some of the other chants out there? Uh, it seems like that there are something specific about that. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what, I mean, th thank you for that. I don't think that there's anything, I'm going to contradict myself. I don't think that there's anything special about the word om uh, specifically, like language-wise. It's, you know, it's, it's not that it, because of the word itself, but, but yes it is, because the way that we move the sound through our mouth in om, if you do it in a specific way, because om is some way that people spell om, but a-u-m, that um, I can hear in my head all the overtones and undertones that's happening. So there's something about that that has more vowels in it. So to me, I also chant home. There's something about th that word, like home. I don't know if it's home, but. Uh, <clears throat> right. I think it's more about the resonance in the mouth and the way you move the mouth through all the different, and you're not hitting all the different vowels, um, but I think it has to do with that. The significance of the word om, I don't know for sure, but that's, that's my assumption. I mean, it sounds like with the wetware you know, comment that the different sounds are doing different things, and we just probably haven't figured out what sounds are doing exactly what. Probably. At least. Well, Aum, uh, each letter even represents something, right? The A, the U, the M, through Hinduism. I mean, mm. through thousands of years of doing it, they've broken it down like that. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, <clears throat> in this, you, you guys are touching upon that not only myself, but I think we, as a species, are only scratching the surface of what our ancestors knew, right? We're coming either deeper into, or I believe, out of this collective amnesia of what all this means. When I was saying these are mundane things like oming, chanting, breathing, I'm not talking about anything new. What I'm trying to do is revitalize the things that we already have at our disposal so we don't feel like we need to seek exogenous psychedelics all the time. We don't, we don't feel like we need something else to come in and save us from the box that we're in. Yes? Yes, it was just to add in Kundalini Yoga. There will be a mix of breastwork and also mantra of sound. So, and we don't know why people have different symptoms in Kundalini. Some people laugh, some people cry, some people get into 
dimension. Mm -hmm. um, but have orgasmic experiences, have orgasmic breakdown experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yoga is the three breath chant. It's, that's some breath work that supports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe, really, going back and looking at these old dis older disciplines with new eyes will really start to revitalize the fact that the technology has been with us. We just haven't seen it. Like Manly Palmer Hall, we haven't seen through the pattern. We're just seeing the thing, like, oh, the body, well, everyone has it, so it can't be that special. Wrong, wrong. We're missing the beauty. We're missing the beauty if we find things to be so mundane that we don't look any deeper into these things. Did it? Oh, I just wanted to chime in. You were saying about Kundalini Yoga, which, which I practiced, and there's a very powerful, if anyone has done it before, a very powerful quote. It's called Ego Eradicator. You put your hands up here, just like you said, and you do breath work. It's called Breath of Fire. And it's a very powerful work. Yeah, there's a couple different, you know, mudras and things you can go into. It's that. always the hands. You know, right. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's a very powerful thing. And then with the own the sounds of the odds from the lower chakra and then the, the next one, the ooh sound is kind of from the, the throat chakra and the, the mm -hmm. kind of is up here. So you're hitting all the, you're kind of cleaning up the, from lower to higher, the chakra codes in the community world. Yeah. It vibrates in the teeth too. And man, I could go so deep into the meridians that connect into the teeth and the fascial system and how they align. But um, uh, what I really would like to do is uh, very shortly, I just want to make sure we have maybe a couple minutes, and Q&A would be awesome, but I want to do an exercise called the Sufi Heart Dance. So just a couple more slides, and then we'll get into the Sufi Heart Dance. All right, you guys down? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> look at this baby, All right? <laughs> Touch and hugging releases oxytocin, All right? So we need to get back to the ancient art of hugging and touching a lot more. It's actually very good for your immune system, hugging and touching. It really is. Not just, think about it. Have you ever heard that babies can die without enough physical and relational contact? Think of that. The Harlem monkeys, uh, the Harlem area that studies it on those capuchin monkeys. I can't tell who's talking right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ventriloquism, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it great. So, when they didn't have, the, when they took away from their mothers. So. Imagine, imagine how important that is, and imagine how disconnected we are. Just, just think of the fact that nowadays it's usually a mom and a dad in a house with locks on the doors with their kids, whereas back in the day we had villages raising our kids. Right? We wouldn't be so frickin' tired. My wife and I are tired as hell, right? <laughs> right? We'd have a little bit more help. That's not admonishing the type of world we live in. That's showing room for improvement. Okay, now the horizontal tango. It's also a very old practice, okay? Remember when I was saying the configurations in the face and just how beautiful this architecture is inside of us? Imagine two beautiful, sophisticated pieces of, of technology or instruments of the divine coming together. Now, remember I said the inauthentic as opposed to the authentic smile being quite different, especially when it comes to the biochemical makeup. Think of an all-night bender and a banger afterwards or real lovemaking. Think of the difference between those two. Same act, different mindfulness, different set and setting. This is the oldest science known to man. It really is. And it's not, it's older than man. You know, the sexual energy is what creates the, uh, you know, the, the, the nebulas and the creations of new stars in the skies. The same energies, the same creative force. We harness it in a slightly different way. And now, one of the most titillating things you can find as you're scrolling through your Instagram our naked bodies and there's something about it that like we just we stop instantly and we want to see that because we have such an interesting relationship with sex nowadays there's this guy Samuel Ambior, um, and he talks about Tantra and he said at the same time that he decided he was going to start opening up the secrets of Tantra to the public to the masses was when pornography started and it's very interesting what pornography does and I don't even think I have to put words to it, but if you think about what pornography does is it burns these images into you. It burns into you what you think this act should be. It's, 
it's most of the time it's gratifying. You don't really, have you ever seen, um, I forget, it's Seth Rogen and some other guy, they made a film called Something Something Make a Porn. Yeah. Zach and Miri. Miri Make a Porn. They were making porn, but they made love and it was the most boring thing. It was just this very slow like, hi, how you doing? Right? And it's like, that's not porn. Porn is this very like, what does the angle look like? And it's, it's very visually uh, excitatory. But to me, this act, it doesn't even have to be sex, but closeness and intimacy and coming together, sometimes even holding hands in a circle and just being together can be a very, very healing exercise. Just giving the space for somebody to be able to speak their mind or cry without judgment is healing enough. If you've been to an ayahuasca circle and there's a sharing circle afterwards and people are sharing, sometimes that's the most profound moment for people. It's just the ability to speak about it and, and bring that moment into the circle. Go ahead. Bless you. I don't agree with this entire thing in its entirety, but in the topic of sex, going to the grave without having a psychedelic experience is like going to the grave without having sex. It means that you haven't figured out what it is all about. I don't entirely agree with that, but I get where he's going with it. Here's the line I love. The mystery is in the body and the way the body works itself into nature. I love that line because the mystery is right here. And a lot of the times we're, we're imagining it has to be, the mystery has to be some grandiose thing that Hollywood has shown us. The mystery is right here in the body and the way we work ourselves into nature. We do that by oming, by breathing. We do that with psychedelics. We do that with all these ancient practices. Almost there. Be careful with that power. Because bringing children into the world is, is it's a beautiful and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be so heavy, but it's powerful. You are sending your seed into the future. And just like a garden, you can't force your children to be a certain way. I'm finding that, right? Like a gardener, you don't yank the, the plant out of the seed, you give it what it needs, you protect it from harm, and you let it do what it's meant to do because it's its own thing. It will go off in the world and do its own thing. And Marie and I were having this uh, conversation last night, <laughs> just the, the trip of being a parent. Go ahead. I like this one. <laughs> There's a lot of what you would call karma in our family. And a lot of times when you can control your environment, you think you're, you think you, you're perfect and enlightened. You think like, oh, I can handle whatever, right? And then you go meet your, your family and instantly you're dropping F-bombs and, <laughs> you know? It's an interesting thing. Go ahead. Okay. I do want to show you guys this. So maybe this will be the last thing. I just thought this was funny. Like the synchronization between the menstrual cycle with women is something that maybe seems like kind of scary to most people, but it's an interesting phenomena. It really is. Um, can we, are we able to click this? Do you think that'll just? Ooh, watch this. The power of community and the drive to harmonize. Okay, not enough flexibility. So when you give it a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of movement, even mechanical objects want to find harmony with one another. Right, how cute. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing. Why do you have to give it flexibility to come into harmony, right? It's, it's kind of this rebellious thing that seems to happen. Whereas if you force somebody to do something that they were gonna do anyway, they don't wanna do it anymore, right? But if you give them the flexibility to do it on their own, it seems like we all want to come into harmony. But we don't like the force, the feeling of being forced into it or being held down into it. Right. 
the space for it. That's very good point. Very good point. So that was that. I just thought that was really cool. It's a really good example. That would be interesting. Fucking table. <laughs> Quite interesting. Quite interesting. Okay. Go ahead and... Okay, go to the next slide. Here's the last thing. Here's the artist inside of us. The artist task... <laughs> Well, we'll just deal with it. <laughs> the artist's task is to save the soul of mankind. And anything less is dithering while Rome burns. If the artist cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. You can go ahead and go back to YouTube and silence it. He said it perfectly. <laughs> okay. And the next slide will be our last. All right. And um, oh, well, two more slides. Story. Remember when I was saying story? There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Remember when I said, remember those pictures of the faces that changed over time? There's no such thing as keeping your story to yourself. There's just agonizing yourself with not being authentic. We want to tell our stories. We've been telling stories around campfires since time immemorial. We want to be authentic. We want to come together. We want to understand one another and appreciate our uniqueness, but we want to harmonize with one another. So the reason why I'm saying bear your story, tell your story, is not just in words. Find your art. I'm a filmmaker. I think the audiovisual arts are extremely mind-altering. You can change people's perceptions for the rest of their life with the right way of saying something, with the right way of showing something, right? The right pace. Uh, if, if you're humble and bold, it's a very powerful combination, right? So, next slide. You guys ever done the Sufi heart dance? Okay, this is the last exercise, and this is so we can come together as a group. Um, and we'll need a little bit of space, but not much. Basically, Emery, do you want to come up here and demonstrate with me? So, left hand on shoulder, okay. and the right hand on, on the chest. Remember, women have things on their chest that we need to be sensitive about. <laughs> Okay, and then it's really, really difficult and complex, but here's what you do. You with me? Yeah. Silently staring into a stranger's eyes. I want you to find those who are willing to. I want you to find somebody you haven't met in the room. And we're going to do this exercise. I'm not going to give much more information because I don't want you to feel like there's anything that should happen here. But we'll do it for about one to two minutes. And we'll see what happens. But this is called the Sufi heart dance. And there's something about the eye that is just captivating. It draws you in, the, the window to the soul. Right? And it's what cops use to see if you're telling the truth. It's what you want to, it's why they tell you to take off your glasses, right? You know, I want to see you. It's like the avatar thing. I see you. Do you guys want to see each other? No? Yes. All right. <laughs> Silence is good too. Silence is good too. Um, so, I mean, you can do it while seated, you can do it while standing up. But I would say just find your spot. Find somebody you haven't met. Use your intuition how to pair up with somebody. And then we'll get started. I wonder if we can find a song on YouTube real quick. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Is this right? Yeah, left hand on, on the shoulder right in front of you. So it's creating a kind of a circle. Right hand on the chest, respectfully. And you just look into one another's eyes. Don't feel like you can't smile. Don't feel like you can't laugh. Just keep eye contact and let whatever happens, happen. So I'll take one big breath together. <sighs> Smile and thank the person you're with. Give a hug. My favorite part about all this is the conversation that seems to happen afterwards. It definitely, like, after such a silence and looking into one another's eyes, especially a stranger. You guys were actually, you know, pretty chill with it. I've had people break down and cry, people just uncontrollably laughing, people that just had to stop because it was intense. Sometimes you feel, am I doing it right? <laughs> There's no such thing as doing it wrong. It's, it's connecting with a stranger. We're advanced. Right? <laughs> I really appreciate that. Honestly, there's a couple things I want to thank you guys for. I want to thank you for showing up, introducing yourselves, giving a little bit of your story, allowing me to share the things that I find to be truly remarkable about the human body. I hope you guys can take just a little bit of what I've said and put it into a practice. And just remember how remarkable the human body is and what I gave you was an armchair researcher's scratching the surface understanding of it. So I wanna thank you guys for a couple more things first. Um, I want to thank you all for showing up on Super Bowl Sunday. I know it was really hard to step away from that. Um, <laughs> Um, and I want to thank you all for showing up in life. Um, those who try plant medicines and go down this journey, this path, they have a thirst for being more connected. They have a thirst for serving more, to understand their own potential, not just for themselves and for their own accolades and adulation, but for others. And the reason why I try and bring the group together with breath, with your voice, and with eye contact and silence is because if we can take this out into the world and acknowledge that it might be a little challenging to stare into some stranger's eyes for a while, but imagine how challenging things are when you go out into the world and you have to deal with strangers on a day-to-day -day basis, when they're not even trying to connect with people. This is the world that we're living in. So I want to thank you guys for wanting to come out and share space with other people who are of like mind. This is the community that I think will really, the psychedelic community, I believe, is in the best shape to bring the most amount of beneficial change and harmony to the world because it's already shown we're doing the work. We're willing to look at the difficulty. We're willing to peer into the darkness and acknowledge that that is also us. And the more we come into harmony, the more we bring each other together, intimacy, touch, holding, even holding yourself and self-care and self-love is one of the best tools that we can teach others and our children. And this will be the new world that I wish to create. 
This is the new world I want my children to grow up in. So thank you for being an integral part of that. Thank you guys so much for showing up today. I want to thank you, Brad, so much for putting this together. I want to thank you all for showing up, taking time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out. So thank you so much. Yeah, let's do this. Thank you. The way you use the word artist, is that interchangeable with mystic, alchemist, or magician? By today's standards, no, but I'm hoping to rejoin these. Um, alchemy, you know, alchemia, you know, is, is this process of inner transformation. That's exactly what I'm talking about here. The artist in us is, I believe, the one that can, like, when we grow beyond and learn that everything is a tool at our disposal, that means we are consciousness and we have everything at our disposal. In that very same way, yes, we are changing ourselves. A mystic, I believe so as well. Because I believe, and I haven't looked up the exact definition of that, but mystics typically are those looking into the mysteries. They're, they're deepening their understanding of the mysteries. And all mystery schools involve themselves with magic. So the magician, I absolutely believe so. I, I believe that, you ever hear people saying that like incredible musicians are magicians or wizards? Really, if you think about that, you, they're creating harmonics. They're coming together like a band, like Pink Floyd, comes together and they do something as a group that none of them could do alone. But it would not be complete if it weren't for the crowd. So there's something about that coming together. But it's, it's the magicians that I think show, I think the artists show the way. And I think the magicians have found or are finding the way. And the same thing with the mystics and the alchemists. I believe they're slightly interchangeable, I guess, to answer your question. I, I think they're, it's semantics, but there are some differences between them. But I think that the root, the root that they're working with, it all spawns from the same source. So yeah, I don't use artist as just somebody who makes art because I believe we are all making art with everything that we do. So, does that yeah. answer the question enough? Do you see a lot of art and artists are coming from a place, I think, unconsciously. They don't know, they're just doing it. Whereas I think when someone's a magician, there's more intention, or if someone's an alchemist, there's more intention involved. They tend to be more spiritual people. I don't think all artists are spiritual, even if they create great work, because some art leaves me, you know, <laughs> there's, there's different vibration levels of different art. For sure, for yeah. sure. Um, I, believe, I believe that some artists, uh, recognizes art yet. Could be true. It doesn't mean that it's not art, it's just that the collective hasn't recognized it as art yet. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and an artist by today's standards, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree because a lot of the times when we think of art, we think of like the, the pieces that were created. Um, and you're right, sometimes for the most part, artists. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not coming with intention and they're not coming with spirituality. It just depends. Because I think some people practice magic and they don't have any clue what they're doing. Right. right? And there are some people who probably call them, like, I know there's a, a lawyer that calls himself the, the, the shaman of the law arts. And she's like, you mean you study law? <laughs> right? So it, it really depends on exactly where we're putting the boundaries of our terms. I think artists with huge egos probably aren't in that category because I think the best artists channel when you know that that's happening. It's not you, not the ego. Mm. It's a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think ego can infiltrate magic as well, mm. as well. But I see where you're going with that, and that's why I'm 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 hesitant to say they're exactly the same thing. You decide tonight. Yeah. <laughs> then the answer is yes. Okay. Forty-five percent yes. <laughs> um, anyone else? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Uh, what did you mean by uh, Planck level phenomenon? Uh, the Planck scale, Max Planck. Planck. Yeah, Max Planck. He was the. I mean, 
from my rudimentary understanding of, of him and his work, was the first to discover and visualize somehow the, um, the Planck scale phenomena, which is the quantum realm. So again, like, you know, it's just a form of magn magnification. One trillion trillion times you're getting down to the Planck scale, which I don't remember the measurement, but it's just you're looking at smaller and smaller and smaller phenomena like up quarks and, you know, right. photons and things like that. Specifically, you thought it was like those measurements were the smallest you could get that are universal. Those are the bits that are universally made out of. It's, mm. it's where your, your observation impacts the results. Mm -hmm. like wave particles. Yeah, photons, phonons, like the smartest particles that we seem to be able to observe. And then this is why a lot of people are saying we're in a simulated reality or a holographic or an information-based reality, which I think there's merit to. I also think that coming up with these new models can help, but I also believe, I kind of like the holographic model, um, but when, you know, even Nassim Harriman is saying like, um, the visual reality we perceive are tiny pixels of information. These are words, you know what I mean? We're still looking at the same world, but um, when talking about quantum phenomena, uh, I mean, there's people like Tom Campbell who, who wrote My Big Toe, and he's looking at, um, he, he's coming up with models that basically solve all the paradoxes of physics and say that really we are living more in a holographic reality and the key, the key that we can harness is within us by will, we can come back into harmony with certain things like, um, well, I mean, it sounds very, you know, on the nose, but like love. Love is, is that key that brings us into harmony and love is also the key that allows for transcendence. Now this is, these are Tom Campbell's words, and this is where my, my research starts to get to the, the top of my level. On that spiral dynamics ladder, uh, I'm probably at like halfway, you know, maybe, and that may not even be right. Um, but my understanding of it is um, that this is the magical realm that we're talking about. This is actually closer to the magical realm, but it's a way of visualizing where magic seems to emanate from because if the observer can change the outcome of whether something is in this locality or that locality if the observer can do that that's saying that consciousness in and of itself which we don't even have good understanding of in academia um, that we are the magicians by harnessing and using consciousness in a way that is not fettered by our beliefs about what is possible and impossible. So, I mean, that's very wordy explanation of it, but... Along those lines, I thought I recall reading something about how our memories are stored as holograms. As holograms? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, the, in... Limitless, my show, I, I'm forgetting the guy's name. It's like, it's another Hawkins or Dawkins or something like that. But basically, he was saying the same thing. Like, what intelligence is, is it's not stored in the connections between uh, our neurons. It's not stored there, but it's, it's accessed. It's, um, it is in the field. And, um, and that's... Rupert Sheldrake talks a lot about this because there, there was an individual that had, I think, only 20, 15, 20, 30% of their brain still went to college, still got a degree, right? And I've, I think this was in Baltimore or something like that. And so he didn't have a lot of the hardware that you would imagine, where, where does he store his memory? Read some Rupert Sheldrake, and he, I think he's probably got the best explanation of what, what's called morphogenetic or um, morphic resonance. And that basically is just saying that we have a field that informs our form. And there are studies where, like, there are certain crystals that grow in certain ways. But as soon as there was some augmentation someplace in the world where crystals formed in a new way, then those crystals, and I think it was like sugar, some kind of sugar derivative or something like that, the crystals started growing in different ways all around the world 
because that had been put into the field of, so like we humans have a morphic resonance with one another. And that might, even, remember when I was talking about the regrowth of limbs, how uh, salamanders and things can regrow limbs, that comes from the, uh, morphic resonance. There is this phantom resonance around us that allows for this, this phantom pain, if we lose an arm, we can still access some of what that was. You cut a piece off of a leaf, and then you go to curly in photography, and you can see that the, the shape or the form is still being represented somehow energetically there. Now, some of this could be a little woo-woo because I haven't gotten too deep into, into the understanding of curly in photography and you know, biophoton emission. But this is what the new understanding with new technology is allowing us to remember about what I believe our ancestors and, and ancients knew to some degree. And I'm not saying that you know, we should go back to our ancient ways. We still want to move forward, but this is, the thing, this is the part of integrating the old with the new. That's why I work with technology. I'm not like, you know, we need to go back and live in the woods and wear loincloths and spear fishing and things like that. That's not realistic in our day today. But I believe that a lot of what our ancestors were, were understanding, we can bring up to date now. And then with our technology, we probably wouldn't need it as much. We probably wouldn't need it as much. We probably would realize what the EMF frequencies are doing to us more if we were a little bit more attuned. I don't know if you guys know this, but like our grandparents were experiencing, I think 100 million times less radiation free-floating radiation than we are today. You know, that's a little off topic, but I mean, I think we, we get a little bit more attuned to ourselves and to our environment, which I believe psychedelics help us do. And you'll start noticing that holding your phone for a while or you keep it here. You guys ever had, you keep a phone in your pocket and it rings and you feel it and you do that for years and then you stop putting it in your park, uh, pocket, your phone rings and you feel it right there? Have you, have you ever had that? It freaked me out, but I mean, I, I can't say I can explain it, but like I've had that experience. Uh, go ahead, Brad. It's out of time, but I just want to give you an opportunity to um, you can tell us what you're working on now. Are you living in the uh, Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm finishing up a cannabis film with Chef Pete Evans. Uh, it's called The Magic Plant. He has a film on Netflix called The Magic Pill. This will be a follow-up to that, um, hopefully going on Netflix as well. And then we'll do one afterwards on uh, awakening methods. Um, he was the one who brought me to Rhythmia, where Jack Canfield, they didn't tell that story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Shit. Okay, real quick. Um, every single time, they would be like ringing the bell like, it's time for your next cup. If you would like it, come on up and drink your next cup of ayahuasca. And Pete and I would be sitting there like, oh, fuck, I can't, oh, no. And here would be Jack Canfield in his 70s, creeping up. And we're looking at Jack, and we're like, oh, you motherfucker, I can't be bested by this guy, <laughs> you know? Jack Canfield was the man, was the man. Um, so the, the next few projects that I'm working on, there's one with that John Chavez guy. Uh, it'll be a docu-series, hopefully for either Amazon, Apple TV, or Netflix. And uh, that one is about the endogenous production of DMT. Understanding DMT and also then going forward, funding some of the studies out of the University of Michigan to learn new ways to promote DMT production and endowasca production inside of us so we can better understand maybe what its role is inside the human body. I was just offered something, and I don't know how much I can talk about it, but I can say this. There's a guy, Anton Bilton, out of London. He is funding the very first extended state DMT um, trials out of Imperial College London, uh, a really well-known team. I think it's, uh, it's not David Newt, it's um, <coughs> Dave, David Luke, maybe, Robin uh, Carhart Harris, and um, Mendel Kalin, really good researchers. And this will be the first time, if you guys don't know what extended state DMT is, intravenous DMT, there's a loading dose, and then Andrew Gallimore, Rick Strassman, and one other individual basically came up with the formula to show 
how much and, and in what way you can put DMT into the system to put somebody into a peak DMT state and then keep them there theoretically as long as you want. So if you guys have done DMT, like straight DMT, it's different than ayahuasca. So ayahuasca, it's extended, say, DMT, but it's, it's D, smoking DMT is different than even a peak ayahuasca experience. And uh, also the levels of DMT in the brain with Rick Strassman were far more. So this one basically, just you know, to, to get to the point, it'll be showing people, psychonauts, going into this realm and the whole thing about it, which is interesting because it's, it's a university doing these studies, the whole thing about it is to see if we can speak with other dimensional or alien life forms because there are a lot, way too many to discount people coming to the table and saying, and people who are holding down functional jobs as well, coming to the table and saying, I was talking with an elf last night. I was talking with aliens, these the little, little tiny creatures that were far smarter than me, you know, and sometimes they're insectoid. I don't even think the form really means as much as the communication, but there's so many people saying that we are communicating with something that is distinctly other. It's not me. It doesn't feel like a higher chamber of my own intelligence. So, this is another film that's probably going to be a high-budget film, likely going to Netflix on extended state DMT, so we can talk to aliens. Um, uh, when, are they, uh, when are they actually going to do that? Uh, again, that's, uh, Quite soon. They just got the signature so we can film it. They've already said, yes, we can do it. Now they said, yes, we can film it, so now we're in talks with going over there and filming people getting on a drip feed of DMT. By the way, I can tell you exactly where Jack Canfield is at this very moment, and you all can listen to him. He's on my friend's radio show, uh, 93.5 Laguna, uh, Inner Journeys with Greg Friedman. So if you go to your, uh, you look at 93.5 Laguna, you can listen live until 9 o'clock, Jack Canfield. Beautiful. Um, so, just a note that I have petitions to get uh, the decriminalization of psilocybin on the ballot here. If anyone wants to sign that, you have to be a registered voter. And if you're not in Los Angeles County, that's okay too. You just have to know that. Each county gets its own sheet. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Was there anyone else? Yeah. Questions for the lion tamer. And then he has a questions for the lion tamer too, as well. It's, it's an incredible book. Also, I think that Andrew Gallimore kind of picked off where parents left off. And a lot of his thinking and a lot of his lectures and stuff like that. His books, Alien Information yeah. Theory. Yeah. 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 Which is a pretty heady book. If yeah. You, it's, sure. it's, it's really it's beautiful. It is. It is. Ben, just curious, what's your regimen on a daily basis? As of right now, with all the information that you have, like what uh, supplements do you take for your flora or no supplements? Or I do take Amari for, m for my gut. Um, I try to eat a wide variety of leafy green vegetables um, and many different colors of the rainbow. Uh, as far as diet, I drink as much water as possible. When I'm drinking water, I try to acknowledge that, you know, this is a communion as well. Um, the the regimen, like, I could, I could go through a bunch of things. I have, like, a bunch of different, like, kind of dynamic movement exercises where I try to get the body to move in very fluid and dynamic ways. I exercise a lot out in the nature because there's micro variables, there's phytochemicals, there's things that cause your brain to turn on that the gym won't give you. There's not as many variables. Mm. And I believe that engaging with more variables really helps. So grappling, wrestling, this is how all mammals learn. And we learn through movement, we learn through play. So I try to include a lot of play, uh, a lot of meditation, um, a lot of physical closeness and touch. I try to challenge myself, like F Flow Genome Project says you will find the flow state at 4% above your skill level. So you place all your challenges just 4% abo above your skill level and that's the optimal range to find flow states. Um, but the main thing is, is bringing mindfulness into all of my practices and also imbuing what would seem very mundane things with more magical quality. So when I'm drinking water, I try to make it some kind of a ritual, some kind of communion that I'm having. When I'm eating the food, I realize these are plant medicines, even if it's spinach and broccoli. Yes. Um, yes. 
to really imbue the mundane with magic. That's mm. my regimen. So I research a lot, and it really takes me in many different directions. So I can't say that my regimen five years ago is the same as today. Right, right, right. But every time I come up with a like a Wim Hof, I take a cold shower every morning, as cold as I can get it. <laughs> Uh, I try to do breathing practice at least three to five times a week and a lot of movement, a lot of movement, and a lot of stillness. So as, as chaotic as that sounds, really what I do is I try to move, breathe, connect with people, uh, sing. I'm a singer. That's my favorite thing to do is make music and sing. And, um, and in that, I try to constantly learn and integrate, learn and integrate. But while doing that, to not get more complex but to actually simplify what it is. And um, my favorite practice is being a dad. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. You guys are amazing. Thank yeah. you. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't bring any of, uh, I had paper to, to put down like email addresses if you guys wanted like newsletters, but I'll just say go to benjosephstewart.com. And you can be, you can put your email address in there if you want. You know, tune in for future events. I'll be back in um, uh, July 12th, correct? 11th, 12th. 11th and 12th. Yeah, for uh, that's the last event. Okay, badass. Please get in touch. Thank you guys. Continue your practice. Give love to your community. All right. All right.